Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm Aaron Brightman. It's my pleasure to welcome an old friend uh, returning to the podcast, Lance Glenn, formerly of 24-7 Sports, college football podcast producer, Rutgers grad, RSU, everything, uh, now doing podcasts for in the financial sector. Lance, thanks for coming back to talk Rutgers football. No, thanks for having me, Aaron. I'm excited to uh, to talk about the, I guess, now 6-4 and four Scarlet Knights. So let's talk about that first, just in terms of Saturday. Obviously, a disappointing performance at Iowa. They were trailing 6 nothing going into the fourth quarter. Offense, obviously, not one of their better days. Defense as well. Uh, I guess some of your initial thoughts from, from Saturday. Well, what more, Aaron, can I say about the offense that hasn't already been said uh, throughout the first part of this week, right? We're recording here on, on Tuesday, and everyone from Facebook groups to – social media pages to message boards has been critical of the offense and its play and its inability really to move the ball besides a few spurts. But to me, what sort of stood out about the game that worried me the most outside of the offense, obviously was the play of the defense, honestly, because we know Iowa struggles. We know that Brian Ferentz is already gone after the end of the season. And at times Deacon Hill, I was started the season as the backup quarterback obviously has started since Cade McNamara's injury, uh, but he's not very good. And this is, you know, no offense to Deacon Hill, but he was the backup quarterback going into the year for a reason. He's done enough for Iowa to obviously win them games, you know, 10-7, 13-6, whatever it might be for the Hawkeyes, but he's not very good. And at times he looked really good against Rutgers defense, the strength of the team, or at least the strength of the team going into the game, right? And it, it worried me to see them, allow Iowa to move the ball like they did. Now, a few reasons why, right? You could you could blame fatigue. You know, obviously they had their bye week recently, but it's still been a very long season, and that was game number 10 for them. Um, obviously players are banged up too, but I'm sure Joe Harasimiak, looking back at the game, is probably thinking the same thing. How did we – give up the yards we did both through the air and on the ground to an offense that is going to fire their offensive coordinator at the end of the year and an offense that's probably one of the worst, if not the worst in the power five. Yeah. Good points. Uh, I think also one thing that kind of maybe wasn't accounted for early on was that, you know, Iowa is so used to these type of games, uh, these grinded out close physical battles and Rutgers really hadn't, like they hadn't been in a close game going into the fourth quarter, you know, maybe a little bit Virginia Tech, uh, obviously Michigan State, they did trail. But, you know, in Iowa against a team that just always guts out these close games, uh, I think that was an, a factor as well in terms of just kind of uh, coming up against a team that's experienced in those situations. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, Iowa – every game they play right is like a three point game or a seven point yeah. game where they either have to kick a game winning field goal like they did against Northwestern or they have to make one final stop. Uh, so they're used to playing those tight games, which like you said, besides the Michigan state game, isn't something Rutgers is really used to doing. And, you know, maybe the other game you brought up Virginia tech, but if I remember that game correctly, it was, I think 21, 16 going into the fourth, but then Rutgers yeah. scored a touchdown really early. It was that Manungai touchdown, I think pretty early in the fourth quarter, so it gave them back that two-score lead, and obviously they just ran with it. And look, speaking of Virginia Tech, I think Rutgers, we could both agree, probably played them at the right time since Virginia Tech is now 5-5 five and five and could potentially also go to a bowl game, which I guess good, looks good on Rutgers, you know, beating another team uh, in the Power 5 that makes a bowl game. But off topic for another conversation, um, yeah, I was used to those types of games. And when you're used to playing in games like that, you're going to play better, right? They're used to having the pressure on them, especially that defense, right? That defense knows that the margin for error is slim to none. They know they almost have to shut out their opponents if Iowa wants to win ball games, And that's what they did to Rutgers. And that's what they've pretty much done all season long. They've given up three, seven, 10 points at most, really. And it's given Iowa the chance to go eight and two this year so far. So they're used to it. And it showed when they played Rutgers, it was a six, nothing game going into the half, I think. But unfortunately that was as close as it was going to get. Yeah, excellent point. And you're right. You've and we've said this all, you've said this offline just in terms of Virginia Tech and Northwestern. Uh, and that kind of leads uh, to my next point is that you know both of those are looking like quality wins now. They both have five wins. 
Shiano had some interesting comments in his press conference on Monday, just in terms of saying going into the year, everyone would have taken six and three trailing six zero at Iowa. Wasn't too pleased about some of the criticism in terms of the play calling and strategy and just, you know, Rutgers not performing that great in that game. Uh, I guess what are your overall thoughts of the season so far? And um, what is your feeling on just, you know, kind of how we should look at the progress that has been made so far for this team? Yeah, I mean, I I sort of agree with him, right? I think, and I've been as critical, uh, at, you know, in regards to the play calling as anyone, right? I think there have been times where Kirk Shiraka has not done a good job. And I think we saw at the beginning of the year, Northwestern, Temple, Virginia Tech, uh, specifically Northwestern and Temple, but you could sort of throw Virginia Tech in there as well, where they got up early and they became insanely conservative to the point where the team that they were playing had to, you know, kind of sort of came back, made it a one-score game before Rutgers kind of took over more Temple than Northwestern. But still, they got conservative, and they sure were sort of running at the clock. So I've been as critical of the play calling as anyone. But to Shiano's point, Rutgers is 6-4. and four, And I don't understand the – trying to think of the right word here. I don't understand why fans – I understand why you're upset – with the result of the IR game as am I and the way the team looked, but because you're upset about the IR game doesn't mean you should be upset about the season. Rutgers is six and four. Most people didn't think Rutgers was going to win a game when six games, I should say this year, everyone thought they were going to win a game, but and most people didn't think they were going to win six games this season. They haven't been to a bowl game legitimately since my freshman year of college in 2014. That was the last time they one had a winning record one, you know, six games plus one more than well, they won five games, I think one season, but uh, that was the last time they legitimately made to a bowl game, obviously take out the Gator bowl when they replaced Texas A&M. So the fact that Rutgers is going bowling and was going bowling so early in the season too, before we even got to November, like this season has been a massive success in my opinion. And regardless of how these last two games against Penn state and Maryland turn out, whether we get blown out by Penn state and Maryland, whether we end up winning one of those two games, right? Like this season, everything else moving forward after they got to six wins, was sort of gravy, right? Like Rutgers was playing with house money. There was no pressure on them. And sure, the Iowa game didn't look pretty. Obviously, you never want to lose to anyone, 22 nothing, whether it's Iowa, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, whomever. You don't want to lose 21, 22 nothing. You don't want to look inept on offense. But the fact is, that game doesn't epitomize the entire season for the Scarlet Knights. This team has taken massive steps forward in – many areas that they needed to, the offensive line, uh, the defense. I think you can even look at special teams play. I think field goal kicking has certainly uh, exceeded expectations, leaps and bounds. And I think Rutgers has found their kicker of the future with Jay Patel. Like they've taken massive steps forward. It's shown both on the field and it's shown most importantly in the win column. So again, while I understand the anger after the Iowa game, I think people who use the Iowa game to then criticize the rest of the season. I think that's silly because there's no reason you shouldn't be happy about the way this year has turned out for Rutgers. They needed to make a bowl game. We all sort of had our eyes on, on year four of Shiano was like the season to get back to bowl eligibility. And they did that. Sure. We want more. We want to win every game. And we thought we saw a big step forward when they played Ohio state really close. And maybe we came a little bit back down to earth against Iowa. But I mean, they're still six and four at the end of the day. They still have their most wins since 2014. Like, who are we kidding? You should, we should all be happy that they're going bowling. They're playing a 13th game. That hasn't happened legitimately, legitimately at Rutgers in the last decade. They're playing a 13th game. Like, let's enjoy it. We're going to get Rutgers football in late December, legitimately Rutgers football in late December. Like let's, let's have some fun with it and let's enjoy it. Totally agree. I think um, you actually could say the fact that, Rutgers four losses, right? I mean, two are against two of the top three teams in the country in Ohio State, Michigan. Then you have Wisconsin, which was pre Tanner Mordecai's entry, which they were, you know, they were ranked at one point, uh, and and potentially, you know, they were going to challenge Iowa for the Big West title. And then Iowa, which you know, I think people really underestimate Iowa. They like to be, you know, it's like a punching uh, punchline because of their offense. But think about also who they've lost on offense, and they keep winning. I mean, other than that, that. Um, you know, fair catch call that was controversial. They could be nine and one and uh, running away with the Big Ten West. So 
they don't have any bad losses, really. And the fact that all of those losses, Rutgers fans were upset because they thought Rutgers had an actual chance to win. Because even Michigan, you know, there was a chance that they, they were in that game. Like, that's progress in and of itself, I think. Just the fact that none of these games have been complete blowouts. Rutgers was in all of them to some degree. Uh, that, it, it, I think, just highlights how far the team has come. Aside from the fact that it's very rare that all your winnable, you know, matchup 50-50 games, you actually win. Rutgers has done that. That is also another step that typically they don't do. Uh, year after year after year, they lose a game that you're like, they should have, you know, that, that was a game on paper we were counting on. So I think those two steps on an, on its own uh, also mark progress, and it's easy to forget. But, you know, I think that's kind of part of the issue is everybody wants more and more and more and to accelerate progress. And, you know, obviously that not beating a ranked team since 2009 doesn't help that narrative. Not beating a, a team with a winning record since you've joined the Big Ten doesn't help that patience. But as you said, if you look at a big picture, you, you kind of have to uh, crawl before you walk, right? Yeah. And and, and I think some people think, oh, portal and all this. And, you know, we're going to get like the Michigan State team from two years ago. But we saw how they crashed and burned and they got really good really quick. And then, boom, it's over. And now they're a disaster. So um, I do appreciate respect the approach that they have. Obviously, some of it is is by um, by not by choice. It's it's, you know, Rutgers doesn't have the NIL to compete like that in terms of getting the top 20 guys from the portal. But I think. Uh, in terms of where they're at, I mean, if you said year four, Shiano's going to make it bowl legitimately, they're going to compete with the top teams in the conference. I, I think that's another one everybody would sign up for. Yeah. And, and like, think about it, right? You mentioned they haven't beat a ranked team since 2009, right? Well, understandably, obviously, we want to break that streak. You want to sort of get that monkey off your back. But would you sacrifice making a bowl just to get a ranked win? I personally wouldn't. Right. And also, look, the schedule, we all looked at it at the beginning of the season and said a path to a bowl game is there. Of course, they had to win all the games they could win, all those toss-up games, which for Rutgers, like you said, doesn't often happen. Well, this year it did happen. That's a step forward. They, yep. The fact that we're talking about Michigan and Ohio State are having already played them and saying how they were in the Michigan game, even though the score maybe didn't look pretty, they were 100% in the Michigan game. And in the fourth quarter, they were within a touchdown against Ohio State. Like the fact that we're saying that, yeah, just shows insane progress over these last four years. And also, look, I I, I understand, right? Rutgers fans want more. They they want to eventually get to that point where like Rutgers is competing with the top teams in the Big Ten East, which I guess you know that won't unfortunately happen in the rest of the time because conferences or divisions, excuse me, are going away, but Rutgers fans want to get to a point where they're competing with the top of the big 10. I completely understand that. But also for the last decade, Rutgers has been either last or second to last in the conference. That's not going to happen this season. Like that in itself is a big step up, right? That we are no longer looking at a one win or two win Big 10 team. We're looking at a three win Big 10 team. And if they win one more game, we're looking at a four win Big Big 10 team, which if they get to that fourth win would be the most Big 10 wins in a, in a season that they've ever had because they only ended up winning, I think, three Big 10. They only have three Big 10 wins in 2014 because that's when they played eight. Uh, yeah. They played eight conference games instead of nine. So they only had three Big 10 wins that season. They still ended up winning eight games, but they, again, only had three Big 10 wins because they played those four non conference games. So, like, there has been so much progress progress, and so many steps forward that like, I think are flying under the radar that like, if you look big picture at it just shows how much progress has been made over these last four years and how much progress was made from last year when they went four and eight to, I think, what are they only beat Indiana last year and lost to, you know, a team like Maryland 36 to nothing or whatever it ended up being to bad. now, you know, a six win team that's, could potentially get to seven. I don't know if they'll beat Penn State necessarily next week, but that Maryland game is certainly on the table at home, right? Like, and and whether or not they win it, the fact that they're at six wins again, the fact that they got the six wins so early, that really the last four games of the season, Rutgers fans didn't have to worry. I personally haven't been worried. I, I haven't been worrying about Rutgers. I mean, I've been watching every single game. I've been critical. I've been stressed because I'm, you know, watching the games. But like, at the end of the day, I know win or lose, Rutgers is going bowling. And I feel like that this season – was the ultimate goal was to get back to going bowling. So I know for me, at least these last four games, while I'm stressed watching the game in the grand scheme of things, I know that 
even if they lose 22 nothing to Iowa, they're playing a 13th game. Hopefully the pinstripe bowl so I can go, but they'll be playing a 13th game and I don't have to worry about them, you know, needing one more win to get to six. Yeah, great points. Uh, they, they did what had to be done, right? They had yeah. to make the progress. They had and how to many times, how many times have we seen workers not do that, right? Like I go back to 20, I think it was 2016 or 2017, where uh, you had like the Chris three. Ash progress season. You went from two wins to four wins. And yeah. it was like, oh, progress, right? Like the next season it would be six wins. But like that four win season, they lost to Eastern Michigan. So yeah. how many times have we seen Rutgers teams not win the games, even Shiano's first season in the COVID year. And I get it. It was a weird year, but Illinois was playing with a backup quarterback that couldn't throw the ball and they lost to Illinois that season, right? Like how many times have we seen Rutgers win games or lose games that they should win this year, every game that they should win, they won. And I know me going into it, correct me wrong, but I think you going into it too, neither of us probably expected them to win every single toss up game that they had on their schedule but they did. So we need to be happy and grateful that Rutgers is at a point where these 50, 50 games or these games where they're slight favorites, they won all the games they're favorited to win, which hasn't happened at Rutgers in a long time. Yeah. I mean, it very rarely happens that you win every game you're, you know, kind of supposed to and, or uh, ha- have a equal shot in winning. Um, I mean, I think some people might say, Oh, they should have beat Wisconsin. But I mean, again, that's at Wisconsin, even though they're in a first year with fickle, you know, down year, that's still really, uh, that, that's, that's another step in the progression of the program. And, um, you know, I think now it's like, you know, maybe you're not in the nicest party room, right? Because you, you, you didn't beat, but you're, you're still in the party, right? You're still, you're still there, uh, where they haven't been for so long. And I think now the biggest concern, I think the last two weeks is how, how are they health wise? How are they depth wise? Can they hold up? You know, we've seen this team get beat up year after year and kind of struggle through the end of November. Obviously, having then a month off more or less going into the bowl game will be huge for them uh, and a lot of great development time for the younger guys. Um, but I wanted to ask a couple more in terms of uh, quarterback. Let's talk about Gavin Winsett, uh, just in terms of his development this year. I think it's almost like he, he, thoughts on him are parallel to the team, right? Where every, they, they've both made progress. Maybe the team and Wims hasn't made the same the same level of progress that fans had hoped, but he's still making progress. So I guess how are your thoughts on his him this season and I guess his overall ceiling or, or future big picture look on him? Look, I think Rutgers fans need to come to grips with what Gavin is. And this isn't like a slight on Gavin. He is what he is at this point, right? He's been in the program three years. I get he's only 19, but like he is what he is. He's a quarterback who struggles with accuracy, that has a big arm, that uses his legs very well, which we're seeing. And obviously we didn't see that last year because he, you know, got injured very early in the season and that kind of hampered him throughout the rest of the 2022 year. But this year we've seen him use his legs in a big way. Like that's what Gavin is. And sure, hopefully that accuracy increases next year, but at least for the rest of 2023, like he's going to be a guy who is around 50% completion percentage. He's going to be a guy who sometimes airmails passes or sometimes wide on passes that he should hit. But he's also going to be that guy who on third and five can get the snap, do a QB draw and pick up six. Or he's going to be a guy like we saw against Indiana who can make a man miss and take it 80 yards. Now, is he going to take it 80 yards every single game? No. But we've seen now that he could be that threat. And if he gets going and he makes a guy miss, he could go all the way, which no offense to Evan Simon. I don't know enough about a Johnny Shepard to say this about him, but we know Evan Simon isn't doing that. And I know fans on message boards and on Facebook pages are, you know, why haven't we seen Simon? Why haven't we seen Simon? I understand it, right? Like you see Gavin's completion percentage and you're saying, you know, Evan Simon could be better and maybe Evan Simon can. I don't know what we've seen from Evan Simon over the last few years that makes anyone think that he could be this great passer. I, I personally haven't seen it. And this is not, I'm not trying to slight the kid, but like, what have we seen from him that that makes Rutgers fans think he's going to be this, you know, all world quarterback with his arm? He, you know, was more accurate than Gavin. That's a fact. But what Gavin can do with his legs, I think, trumps the accuracy difference between him and Simon, right? Like, I'd rather Gavin out there at around 45 to 50 percent completion percentage, but with the ability to rush for 100 yards in a game than Evan Simon around 55 percent completion percentage without the ability to rush for 100 yards in a game, especially with the way Rutgers offense is sort of 
stack and is sort of laid out. They're a running team. Like, that's what they are. Fans need to understand that this team isn't magically going to now, you know, try to throw the ball for 250, 300 yards. They're not going to do that. They're going to throw the ball 12 to 15 times a game, especially if they're leading, probably even less than that. And they're going to run the ball 35 to 40 times a game. Like, that's what their offense is. And for that style of offense, the only quarterback that makes sense is Gavin because on the roster right now, and again, I don't know much about it, Johnny Shepard. We've seen one drive of him so far this season and in his Rutgers career. But between him and Evan Simon, the best quarterback at running this type of offense is Gavin Wimsat, bar none. Like, it is hands down Gavin Wimsat. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I agree. And I also think at this stage – you're messing with his development if you take him out now, right? Because you have two more games to go, then you have the bowl. Um, but th- I think they're so far down the road, like they're all in on Wimsett. Like what, what what, what really has happened for them to have regrets now? I mean, yes, they're limited in some capacity. I also think, aside from his continued development, I, I, I do think that Shiraka is still learning how to kind of utilize him. Uh, you know, I, I, and, and again, I've, I've said this at nauseum, but I think he's been put in a lot of second half passing situations that I don't think set him up to succeed as mm-hmm. well, uh, as if they were a little bit more aggressive with him throwing a first down throwing, you know, when, when they're not trailing by multiple scores. Um, and I also think that, that he's still just learning how to kind of what best works for his skill set. So I think next year, you know, we could see a, a, a leap forward. I, I agree with you. I think, you know, he's never going to be a 60% passer, right, in terms of accuracy. But if he can take another step forward, and, and, and again, he's made some amazing throws at times. It's just the consistency factor hasn't been there. Um, but I think that uh, at this stage, you know, he, he got you to six wins. Uh, you have two games to go. You have the bowl game. Pulling him now, it's, it, you know, and, and it's funny because fans forget, like, Shiano got a lot of criticism warranted uh, back in the day, you know, when he uh, pulled, you know, Savage, when he, um, you know, was constantly tinkering with the quarterbacks and, you know, it, it got, it did burn them at times. So I think that they, they've shown the opposite approach here and you're so far into the season and so far all in on Wednesday. Uh, he's shown some positive signs. I think you have to continue to go. And get the yeah, most absolutely. You, ha- you, ha- you have to continue to ride with Wimsat. And like you said, at this point of the year, or this point in the year with two games left to go, and then obviously that third game, the bowl game, it, it just doesn't make sense. You're way too far into the year. You want to tell me you're going to reevaluate come the offseason and heading into 2024? Sure. Like, who knows what Rutgers quarterback room is going to look like at that point, yeah. right? You're going right. to, assuming, have Gavin. You're going to have a Johnny Shepard. You're going to have A.J. Cerise. My guess is Evan Simon's probably going to transfer out just because that's the world we live in in college football today. You could have a veteran come in, right? Maybe they decide to, you know, we're going to bring in a fourth guy. We'll redshirt to race and we'll let, you know, a veteran Gavin and a Johnny Shepard will try to battle out and see if Gavin's still the guy, right? Like you want to reevaluate come 2024. Sure. Go ahead. Right. But with right. two regular season games left, having gone through all the struggles with Gavin that you've gone through this season, why would it make sense to pull him right now? You're not beating Penn State whether you have Gavin Wimsett or Evan Simon. I'm sorry, but I know Penn State's going through a lot, and maybe this is you know jumping the gun on potentially talking to Penn State, but like I know Penn State's going through a lot with Mike Yersich, having recently fired him, and now a new offense under I think Bill O'Brien's son, Daniel O'Brien. Maybe it's his son. Maybe they just have the same last name. I don't know, but you're not beating Penn State whether you have Gavin Wimsett or Evan Simon. So. You might as well just continue to run with Gavin. I think he gives you a much better chance to beat Maryland than Evan Simon does. And he's been your guy for the last, you know, 10 plus games. What's the point of pulling him at game 11? There's just no point. He's gotten you to where you needed to go to this season. I understand you're upset about Iowa, but like, again, you're going to fault him for one game and then pull him. Like, it just doesn't make sense to pull him right now when he's gotten you to where you needed to go here in year number four. If you were at four wins or five wins at this point, sure, you want to make a change to try to spark your team in the last two games to get to a bowl game, fine. But you're already at a bowl game. He's gotten you to where you need to go. Like, why are we worrying about him and get and, and pulling him right now? It's it's frankly a silly conversation. Not not silly conversation you need to have. It's silly that fans think now is the time to pull Gavin. Yeah, I think it's just a frustration thing. Uh, I agree. It doesn't make sense. And, uh, you know, no, no fan base wants to free the backup quarterback more than Rutgers over the years. I'm surprised uh, we haven't seen the hashtag uh, free Simon and mirroring the free Reddick, which I, in that case, I think Hayden Reddick should have played, which I think I, we all think Hayden Reddick should have played. 
But uh, yeah, I'm surprised we haven't seen the free signing yet. <laughs> yeah, well, and it kind of it's perfect tie into Penn State. Uh, just kind of like last topic I wanted to ask you about in terms of, you know, it, it is like firing the offensive coordinator with two games to go. And, you know, granted, Penn State has two losses. It just seems kind of comical. Uh, and, and I'm all for, I agree with you, fully evaluating everything at the end of the season. That's what it's there for. You have the right time to do that. Um, I guess, how do you think that's going to impact this game? And overall, how do you think that these two teams match up? I don't think it's going to impact that game all that much, frankly. Like, Penn State is what it is. I think, frankly, I I'm surprised Franklin pulled the trigger on your sitch with two games to go. I think it was inevitable, inevitable this offseason. Like, I would have been shocked if they went into 2024 with Mike Yersich as the OC because, you know, we know for Penn State, like Ohio State and Michigan, the only games that really matter to them on the schedule are when they play one another. So while Penn State can beat Maryland 51-13 to or they could, you know, beat Michigan State 31-0 or whatever the score that game was, like, the only games that mattered to Penn State were Ohio State in Columbus and Michigan at home. And in both those two games, Penn State – you know, did nothing offensively and they were bad on third down. So like I was surprised he pulled the trigger now, but I had always thought that your was gone at the end of the season anyway. So look, I don't think it's going to affect Penn state that much. It's not like players are sitting out because Mike your got fired, right? Drew Aller is still going to be the quarterback. Nick Singleton and Katron Allen are still going to be the running backs. Their wide receiver group is still decent. It's not great. Obviously it's not the likes of Penn state or uh, of Ohio state or Michigan, but like, you know, Keandre Lambert Smith's a good player. Dante Cephas is looks like he's starting to sort of come on. They have a very good tight end group too. Like Penn state still has the advantage over Rutgers in almost every position. So I think that regardless of whether Mike Yersich is there or not, Manny Diaz is still there as offensive coordinator. The offensive scheme isn't changing just because Mike Yersich is, isn't there. Like Danny O'Brien, I'm sure, is going to run the same offense. The playbook's still going to be the same. So I really don't think like that firing will have a big impact, if, at, if an impact at all, on, on the game this Saturday. Uh, so last question for you. What, what – I guess what are you knowing that going in, right? And we know Rutgers is a big underdog. What I guess are you looking for in this game from Rutgers that could be an encouraging sign? Yeah, I mean, I think like we saw with Michigan and Ohio State, just be competitive. And, you know, I think they've they've done that, right? If you looked at Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State and you wanted to check the box off of three games and you want to be competitive in all three, right? You've checked it off against Michigan, you've checked it off against Ohio State. So you're two for two. You want to check it off against Penn State. You want to be three for three. Again, maybe everything breaks right for Rutgers. The ball bounces every which way, and it's a game come, you know, five minutes left in the fourth quarter. You know, if that happens, then wow. Then maybe Rutgers pulls it off. But realistically, Penn State, you know, I think it's a 20 and a half spread or something like that, maybe a 21-point spread. Regardless of what it is, it's close to a three-touchdown spread. Like it wouldn't, you'd hope that Rutgers covers, right? You don't want to lose by 21, 22, 23 points and, you know, be sitting there at the end of the game and it being 35 to seven Penn state or 42 to seven Penn state, right? You want to keep it close. You want it to be a game in the second half. I doubt the atmosphere is going to play a huge role as crazy as that sounds with Rutgers going to happy Valley. Like at the end of the day, Penn state fans know their season is kind of over right? Or the expectations they had for this season are, are, are done, right? Like for Penn State, it was, let's go to the playoff. Let's try to win a Big Ten title. Those dreams have now been shattered. There's still going to be 100,000 people there, but the excitement level and the anticipation and the hype around this team at Penn State is now gone because they've lost to Ohio State and Michigan. So like, I don't think the crowd is going to play like this overwhelming factor where Rutgers is going to have five or six false starts, although they had five false starts against Iowa. So I guess you never know. But like, I don't think the crowd is going to play some like huge role that completely impacts Rutgers and completely takes them off their game. I just think right now with the way they recruit Penn state in pretty much every position is just more talented. And again, that's not like a indictment on Rutgers and Greg Schiano. It's just that Penn state recruits at another level. They recruit at a top 10 level. It just is what it is. Talent wins out in college football. I think Penn state wins. I think they win, you know, by 17 points, right? Like if you need a score, I would probably say, you know, 28, 10 or 27, 10, or, you know, maybe 31, 14, something like that. 
Yeah, I, uh, I, I think, you know, I'm worried that Penn State, the team, is going to play angry after losing mm-hmm. to Michigan. I think, you know, Franklin can deny it all, all he wants, but I think he gets Penn State up for Rutgers every year because every year I feel like Penn State, you know, under Franklin has uh, really given them a really hard time and played really hard. They've destroyed them in the trenches the last couple of years, so I'm a little nervous because I think that Rutgers is banged up. So yeah, it could be it, it could be an ugly game for sure. It's going to be a physical game again. Um, I think Rutgers is as best positioned to play them well as they have been under Shiano, but it's going to be a big challenge and uh, all, all great points. Any any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, and I do want to say this right. Like Rutgers fans, obviously, were not happy with the offense against Iowa. Penn State's defense is just as good as Iowa's. So it's not like you know Rutgers is going from Iowa with a great defense to a team with a mediocre to bad defense like Penn State Penn State's defense is one of the best in the country with multiple first round picks on it throughout the next few years and multiple NFL players on it so it's not like it's going to get any easier for the offense it could be another rough offensive game like let's be real it could be you know I said 14 points would it shock me if Rutgers puts up three would not shock me at all if Rutgers only puts up three points against Penn State like this offense is uh, this defense is really good um so but but with that said like I still don't think it's time to get so discouraged like don't forget just because Rutgers offense isn't great like the defense they're going up the defenses they're going up against are really really good so it's not like they're struggling against bad defenses they're struggling against defenses that have made most teams they've played struggle right like everyone loves to say Maryland has this high-flying offense with Talia Tagovailoa well Maryland put up 13 points against Penn State's you know defense so it's not like you're going against the defense that's bad you're going against one of the best defenses in the country that's an excellent point. And, you know, I almost, if, if I had to sign up for it, I would take, you know, a bigger margin of defeat against Penn State where potentially maybe you do end up, you know, resting some guys at the end and and, and have everything going for Maryland when yeah. it's the more realistic opportunity to close the season strong. So we'll see. We'll see what happens if, you know, they do kind of fall out of it in the second half, how they approach that. But uh, great insight as always. It's great to have you back and I'll definitely be talking to you soon enough. Uh, Lance, Glenn, thanks so much for being here and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron.